Hello and welcome to another episode of Goddess of Crypto. I am unbelievably excited today because my guest is the host of her own show, Coin Stories, the incredible Natalie Brunel. I can't tell you why I ran into her on crypto Twitter, but I did early on and she has been somebody that I have seen as kind of a shining light for people explaining about Bitcoin and also being super, super nice in the space. The sacred divine feminine is creative, abundant, flowing, receiving, and disruptive. And the new energy of money, including cryptocurrency, decentralized finance, NFTs, and even the metaverse is all these things too. Welcome to the Goddess of Crypto, a weekly show where women who are already in this powerful space will cover these topics simply so you can relax into knowing that the future of finance is female. So Natalie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the kind words. I'm excited for our talk. Yeah, me too. So I feel like, you know, I love to start with this question, like what caused you to get into the space that you're in right now? What caused you to get excited about Bitcoin? Sure. So it's a very interesting story. And I think I was predisposed to appreciating Bitcoin long before it was even ever invented or released into the world. Um, I'm actually a first generation immigrant and my parents worked really, really hard. They came here when I was very young from Eastern Europe and my parents grew up under communism. So I always heard stories from them about just how difficult it was to, you know, get basic necessities. They would have to wait in lines and there was really no sense of economic opportunity or social mobility. It was basically like, you kind of did what your parents did and money was not that easy to come by and no one was able to really take care of or plan for future generations. And everyone looked to America as the place for, you know, I don't know, the American dream, economic opportunity, freedom, self-determination. So my mom dreamt of coming to the U.S. at a very young age, and she wasn't able to make that happen until her late 30s. My dad was in his early 40s. So they came and they started from scratch. They started over. They didn't know the language. And I admire them so much for their, their strength and their courage and sacrifice. And I watched them work really, really hard because when you start over in a new country, um, you know, you have to start from the bottom. And I saw them working multiple jobs, were, you know, into the week weekends, just trying to make it for, for their family and for their kids. Um, they worked really hard and they were really good at saving. So they finally were able to purchase their first house in about 2004 or five. And so I spent my call or high school years living in that, in that home. And then the financial crisis hit while I was in college and they lost everything. So just as they finally achieved the American dream, you know, the home with the two kids and the vacation once a year, they lost everything. And, um, that was really hard for me to witness because I think that it planned a seed and a fire in me where, first of all, I was so confused. Like, how did this happen? You know, my parents were good people. They played by the rules. They worked really, really, really hard. How did they just lose the house that we're in? And, and it also made me angry. It made me frustrated. Like, you know, I've, I'm seeing these big corporations and wall street getting bailed out, but my parents losing are losing their house. Like, how is that fair? Well, how is this American? Um, so I entered into a career in media. I, I pursued journalism and I just felt like something was wrong in the system, but I really didn't know what. And I spent the next almost 10 years really documenting what I felt was almost a demise of the American dream, a decline of the American dream, a feeling that the country was becoming more and more polarized. People felt like they were left behind. Everything was getting more expensive. Wages weren't keeping up. And people started pointing fingers, right, as we probably would do. This, this person's the problem. This team's the problem. This person's the problem. And when I started to learn about Bitcoin, which is only just a couple of years ago, I started to connect the dots that so many of the problems that exist within our society and that I had been reporting on and documenting as a journalist are because our financial system is so broken and it socializes the losses and it puts it on the backs of the working class and the middle class and it privatizes the gains and makes the rich ever more rich. And so we have this growing wealth concentration. And there's a potential solution through technology, which I found so much hope in because before Bitcoin, I started to look at the future like, 
man, I, how's this going to get better? Every, every year it seems to get worse. People get more angry. It's more expensive. And now I look at the future with a lot of hope. I think that Bitcoin will usher in the ability to rebuild our financial system in a way that's more inclusive and more fair. And that's what really inspires me. So that's why I decided to start my podcast and start educating people about Bitcoin. Oh, that's really powerful. And um, I think you're, you're right. Your background is absolutely what brings you into the, that world because you didn't take the American dream for granted as so many others did and, and have and continue to do. Um, as we're recording this, uh, this episode, we've just gone through what they call a black swan event, which is this kind of horrible crashing of like, all the markets, all the time. It's really been fun for everyone to watch. And Bitcoin is at its, I don't know, like late last, like the, the low of the last year. And it looks like it's probably going to go down further. And yet here you are and here I am saying, hey, we should all do this. Let's all jump into the pool together. So talk about that a little bit, like about maybe why you're not afraid and also why others shouldn't be. Sure. So I really think it's important to understand that, you know, we talk about Bitcoin like an asset, almost in the same way people talk about maybe stocks, but Bitcoin is really a powerful technology network and it's, and it's in its baby stages right now. It's, it's in the process of monetizing, but it's a computer network. It's a technology. And that's a really powerful thing because, you know, I kind of liken it to the the nineties when a lot of people experienced the tech, the nineties dot com bubble, you know, think of when the internet was coming out, how many people didn't really see how it would transform their lives, that we, that we would have companies that completely are digital, right? That we would be interacting the way that we are now because of this powerful technology. And a lot of companies were formed during that time that ended up going totally under. They went totally bust. Anyone can create a cryptocurrency and anyone can, could have created a, a, a website. And some of those companies went on to become Amazons and major players in the space and others, you know, drew down and then went completely bust. And so I, I urge people to be a little bit cautious, but I want people to see, start seeing Bitcoin as what it is, which is essentially the internet of money. Okay. In the same way that the internet has no CEO, it has no headquarters, it has no, no central point of failure or authority that's behind it. Bitcoin is the same way. It's completely decentralized around the entire world and no one can, you know, affect change without the consensus of everybody else. So it's truly unique in that space. Whereas other cryptocurrencies can't, you can't say the same for them. And so in the same way that in the dot com bubble, we had some things, you know, rise and fall and rise and succeed to become, you know, the biggest companies. I think we're going to see the same thing in the in the tech space. And some of that is happening right now. We don't have bailouts in cryptocurrency. It's a system that is not regulated. And it's really like the wild, wild west because it's so new and so nascent. And so people will, you know, potentially lose money, potentially gain a lot of money. But Bitcoin at the foundation of that is really, again, sort of the Internet version of money that can transform not only our ability to save because it's a powerful savings technology and store of value, but also our ability to transact with one another across the world without third parties taking a cut. So it's really, really powerful. And I think it's important to look at it. Um, and, you know, you have to zoom out, right? Because we do see this volatility right now with everything, stocks, bonds, uh, crypto, Bitcoin, everything's coming down because of the greater macro picture, which we can talk about if you'd like. Um, but this is a long-term horizon. This is a long-term investment that hopefully will allow you to help plan for your future, plan for your family. And so even though things draw down, that's actually sometimes the best time to buy. It's the best opportunity to actually create wealth because you're buying when it's low and then hopefully you're, you're watching it appreciate. So I know it's volatile, um, but I urge people to be careful with some of the things they invest in. But Bitcoin is that long-term bet that I'm really confident about. Yeah. Yes. Well, I certainly agree about that. I, I agree that it's a good long-term bet. Um, I, uh, I lived through the dot-com boom. I was in, you know, I just started my very first company in software and, you know, got caught up in the dot-com crash and my company went out of business because of it, even though we weren't a dot com. Because basically all the tech companies yes. like, you know, got flushed down the toilet for in, in, in a matter of a few months. Yeah. And um, it was really like, you know, for me, it was like going to MBA school and mm -hmm. uh, CEO school and all, yeah. you know, an entrepreneur school all at the totally. same time. It was really amazing. 
Um, and I've talked in the past on several episodes, both about my own dot-com experience and investing in that period and seeing the market crash. And I've been saying since the beginning of the show that I've been expecting to see you know, these huge dips because a couple years after, you know, like 97, 98, everything went up. And then 2000, it was like, boom, everything just yeah. crashed into the, the ground. Mm -hmm. And, um, and at that time it was related to just the tech stocks, as opposed to the story that you told about your family in 2008, when the market crashed and I lost my house at that point as well. Um, and I was in real estate, so I lost my livelihood and my house because I lost my livelihood. So nice. we really saw like this, it was, that was everywhere. It wasn't just yeah. limited to the tech sector. That was then everywhere. Right. Um, I just, I feel like there's a lot of, of there, there's a lot of fear with, especially women. I, mm -hmm. It's not a, it, exclusive to women, but I feel it, especially women, there's this, this energy and I talked about this in, a, in an episode just a couple of weeks ago. We have this feeling of, well, if the big guys are losing all their money, like what the hell am I going to do that's better than what they're doing? How should I even begin to get into the market if I don't have that economic degree or I don't have that financial mm -hmm. experience? So, you know, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I completely agree with you, especially because this space is dominated by so many men, sort of the, the tech space at large, I think. But also there's almost like a, a gaming aspect to it. And, and I think women are inherently a little bit, you know, dissuaded from those types of spaces. And, and we play risk very, very carefully, which I think is great because we want to take care of our, ourselves and our, our families in the future. But that's the thing about Bitcoin that I think is so beautiful. You know, people see it as very, very risky. And I will agree with one thing that it is very volatile in the short term, but I actually see it as one of the most risk-free investments that you can explore right now, because we've created this monetary system over the last several decades in this country that basically requires you to have to earn the money that you make twice or gamble it essentially, because the money that you earn in whatever job you have, and I'm sure you have people in your audience that do everything from hairdressers to doctors, to accountants, to media professionals, whatever it may be, but you have to take that money that you make in your job. And then you have to go, Hmm, if I put it in the bank, I'm actually going to lose money because of inflation and because the interest rate on that bank accounts like 0 0.00 whatever percent. So now uh, the traditional method has been to a turn your house into a savings account. Everyone just basically says, well, this is the value of my house. And now when I sell it, I have to buy ex an extremely expensive house <laughs> the next go around. Or we've had sort of in the 90s, what developed is that stock bond portfolio, the 60-40 portfolio. And people started really, really moving into stocks, especially over the last decade. And, you know, that inherently has a lot of risk. All of a sudden you have to research com companies or you have to have a portfolio manager. People are becoming day traders. It's like, why does it have to be so hard to take the money that you earn and see it increase or at least just maintain in value over the long run? And that is what Bitcoin was designed for. That's the beauty of it, because as our money supply expands and especially the people at the top that get the first access to it because they're closest to the money printer, they're politically connected or they're part of big companies, they get to allocate it and purchase up all these stocks, stock buybacks, they buy assets, they inflate the uh, stock market, they buy real estate. And guess what? All of that goes up and the middle class and the savers get sort of crushed because they're just dealing with inflation. And that's, again, not a system that's fair. So Bitcoin was sort of designed to address that by making sure that it's a technology network that will never have its supply expanded. There will only be a certain amount of Bitcoin that are ever created and no one can control it. No one can operate it. It's a completely decentralized network in the same way that the internet is decentralized. And so now we have the potential for a savings technology that as we zoom out is only going up in value like this while the purchasing power of the dollar is declining. And so I think it's really powerful. And I think that women should start to look at the space as a really great opportunity. You know, we want to be part of that financial transfer, that wealth transfer that potentially could happen with a technology like this. And it is a way to take care of the hard earned money that you, you make and you want to protect. Um, so that's the way I view it. And I don't look at Bitcoin as like, you know, I purchase it today and then I watch the price. Like I would, if you buy a house, do you watch the price of it every day? No, you know, it's a 
long-term investment that you sort of put away. This is how much I'm going to allocate as a savings account for me to make certain decisions with my future, a house, college, whatever it might be. And so don't look at it. Don't look at it for four years. You know, no one has ever put in money in Bitcoin, held it for at least four years and lost money. And I think that's important to point out. Um, so I really encourage women to sort of get involved because I think all of us want the same thing, right? We want to be able to take care of ourselves and our families and plan for the future. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I take that a lot further, actually. My feeling is that, uh, you know, we need to return to some version of a matriarchal society because women now are being given the chance to show up in the world, not just as the nurturers and the caregivers of their families, but the nurturers and the caregivers of nations. And when we have that opportunity, that allows us to take control in a way that allows growth and power and wonderful things to happen from a space of the sacred divine feminine, not from the space of the masculine, which, you know, I mean, we're at war right now because a man said, I want that thing over there and I don't care that it doesn't belong to me. And I feel like women would have been kind of more negotiable at that, you know, at that rate. You know, I, I really recognize um, how few women are in this space right now. I think the ratio is somewhere around 15% to 85%. So I want to do whatever I can to make women feel a little bit more welcome because I think community is really important to us as well. And I, you know, Bitcoin has been the most welcoming community to me and it's allowed me opportunities economically that I didn't even think were possible. And I just would love to, to share the message with moms out there and with other women that are working so hard at their jobs and feeling like they just, they want to be able to figure out how they're going to afford a house or their future children or whatever it might be. And there's a lot of suffering right now. Unfortunately, millennials have, I think that, you know, previous generations have sort of kicked the can down the road and placed a tab on us that has made everything so expensive that the average millennial feels like buying a house is out of reach in many cities. And that shouldn't be the case, especially, you know, people working harder than ever and being mo more educated than ever. So I would really like to see a system that's more inclusive in general. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I feel like the more we put power in the hands of women, financial power especially, the better off we'll be. A woman shares between 80 and 90 percent of every dollar that she makes inside of her family and her community. The statistic with men is 30 to 40 percent. So 30 to 40 cents of that dollar is being shared inside of the family and the local community. So imagine how much more power in that community a woman's dollar has. So to me, when we put the money in the hands of the woman, we're gifting the whole world you know, to become a better place, we're gifting them that opportunity. And I think that's very, very important. You're right, though. It's, it's interesting because I, I have a different um, I have a different gauge that I use for my 15 percent. I walked around the Bitcoin conference and I used my eyeballs and then I asked what percentage of the people here are women. And I heard 15 percent. And I was like, well, there you go. And so that's the statistic I've been using. So I'm really happy to turn yeah. that it, it turned out it was accurate. Yeah. So um, I want to ask you, um, what do you feel like the pitfalls are of the dollar as we move forward in time? Yeah, you know, I think it's really sad that we're in such a position of growing weakness with the U.S. dollar. Um, but, you know, we're we've come to a place where we are very globalized right now and we rely on trade with a lot of different countries. And sadly, we've exported a lot of our wealth. You know, we're a country that used to make a lot, manufacture a lot here. And as the result, we did have a stronger uh, labor and working class here. And then because of the dollar becoming the global reserve currency and the petrodollar, we've exported our dollars out. We've made it cheaper to have uh, labor overseas. Yep. Explain petrodollar. I know mm -hmm. that's not a phrase that anyone's heard on the show yet. Yeah. So two things happened really in the, the 1970s that are of great consequence. Number one is Richard Nixon took us off the gold peg for the U.S. dollar, which means that prior to that, for the most part in the history of the United States, you could actually redeem your dollars, your paper notes for gold at the bank. And, and our U.S. currency was 
backed by gold. And if and if U.S. citizens couldn't um, redeem the money for gold, other countries could or the, the dollar actually had reserves in central banks that were maintaining the value based on a scarce commodity, which is difficult to produce, which was gold. Um, Nixon took us off the gold peg and essentially allowed the um, free market to judge the value of gold. And U.S. dollars essentially became backed by the faith of the U.S. government and a very powerful military. And and so ever since then, there's a beautiful website that I urge people to go to called WTF happened in 1971.com. And it's literally a page of dozens and dozens of charts of the price of the cost of living ever since we uh, ventured off the gold peg. So it literally shows you the cost of like Campbell's soup, the cost of apartments, uh, wealth inequality, uh, cost of, I mean, everything just beca- balloons and it goes parabolic after we lost that gold peg. The second thing that happened is our government officials came into an agreed agreement with countries that produce oil, namely Saudi Arabia being one of them saying that you can only accept dollars across the whole world for payment. So basically, we began, we every country became dependent on making sure that they have the dollar in reserves, because if they wanted to purchase oil and energy, they needed to pay for it in U.S. dollars. So it was this monopoly that was created. And at first, it had the initial effect of being a boon for America, because a lot of wealth immediately came to the United States and there was a huge demand for our dollars. But in the long run, it's growing into a situation that's impoverishing a lot of people because as we export our dollars and we hyperinflate other currencies, well, the situation is that we also lose the middle class. We lose manufacturing. A lot of people complain, right? My jobs are now overseas. We're importing a lot of goods that are made cheaper somewhere else because the dollar we made so strong, essentially. And that's kind of what happens. And it gets a little bit complicated into the weeds of like macroeconomics, but that's essentially how it works. And then we initiate a situation where every single time our economy tried to cleanse itself of basically bad investments, right? People pour money into projects that maybe are good, maybe are bad, and the economy would start to crash down. The Federal Reserve, which is essentially it's maintaining our government money supply and printing money. And neither federal nor a reserve which I think is always important mm-hmm. to point out in that. Yeah, we didn't, elect these, we, we didn't elect yeah. these people. That's right. Um, they rush in and they essentially they flood the economy with more money because they 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 need to save the popping of the bubbles. The problem is when you when you save the bubbles, it's really the people at the top that are getting saved. The people that took the most amount of risk that should maybe potentially have failed. And instead we prop up the bubble even bigger, even bigger. And that's what we've seen over the last few decades. Like they rushed in with money printing after the dot-com bubble, they reinflated it. A lot of that money went into housing. We reinflated, we inflated a housing bubble, then that collapsed. And now for the last more than 10 years, we've been quantitative easing and providing liquidity and stimulus into the economy. And now we have a bubble of everything, to be honest with you, we have a housing bubble. We have an equities or a stock bubble. We have an everything bubble that was accelerated and made even bigger with more pressure that we're feeling, you know, deflate right now because of the pandemic, because all of a sudden they needed to respond and they needed to print even more money. But here's what I want people to think about. If we were a healthy economy, like so many of these politicians on both sides of the, of the, of the aisle say, um, they say so often, our economy is so strong. It's never been stronger. I made it so strong. If our economy was that strong, number one, we wouldn't be in such great debt. We wouldn't be the world's largest debtor nation. And number two, a pandemic, which was supposed to last only, I don't know, two weeks, right? The initial closures wouldn't have completely ground everything to a halt and and caused everyone to become on the brink of sudden bankruptcy with people, you know, having no savings and no ability to pay unless the government stepped in and helicoptered money. Is that a healthy economy? No one has savings. No one's able to like handle, you know, a closure. Well, it's because our system is based on debt. We have so, so, so much debt. And so now how do we get out of it? Like I said, we have this everything bubble. And now that the federal government is coming in and they're saying, hey, we we kind of need it. We, we printed too much. OK, we need to raise interest rates and we need to make it more expensive to borrow. And we need to start to slide some of the money off of our balance sheet because we're too far in debt. And as that bubble contracts, we're seeing everybody sell everything. They're selling stocks, they're selling crypto, they're selling Bitcoin. And I don't know how far down it could go, but it's, you know, it's volatile times. 
as the result of our whole, our money system. And it goes back to these decisions that have been made over decades and over history that many of us probably never even learned in school, right? The fact that Nixon took us off the gold standard and made our dollar, our paper, basically you can print it out of thin air, however much you want. And the petrodollar, where everyone has to use the dollar um, to, to purchase certain commodities. So I think we're seeing a transformation now. And I think a lot is going to change as more countries go into the digital currency space with central bank digital currencies. Countries are de-dollarizing. You know, we're saying, oh, we're going to sanction you. And some and literally countries are saying, well, I have gold in my reserves. I have digital yuan in my reserves. I have you know, they're basically responding, saying, well, we're going to change our system if the government, if the U.S. government is just going to try to maintain its monopoly. So I think a lot will change over the next 10 years. And again, I think that this shines a light once again on the importance of having Bitcoin, which no one can control and manipulate, um, as opposed to some of these changing factors and geopolitical issues. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, I agree with pretty much everything you said. I learned some new things, so I'm excited about that. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I guess I feel like, I mean, nobody really taught us in school unless it was at a higher education level. I think that's pretty clear. Um, you sound like you've been to an economic school, and I'm <laughs> sure you have the economic school of the world because you're paying <laughs> attention and because you have all these great guests on your show. And I mean, it's really, it, you. this information is available for mm -hmm. us to learn. And there isn't a rule that says, hey, you know, you have boobs, you're not allowed to learn it. There used to kind of be, even if it was not explicit, there was this kind of pat you on the head and like, oh, that's okay, sweetie, your husband will teach you this stuff or take care of it for you because he never taught you. But we don't have that really anymore. We're able to save ourselves and we're able to be sovereign entities. And I think that's really important because the stuff that you're talking about is it, it, it's, it's, it helps if you know like where we've come from so that you understand where we're going. I knew people, this was about, well, right before the housing crash, I knew people who were like, we're going to a gold standard on Tuesday. We're going to a gold standard within 14 days. I mm -hmm. still hear people say that, but it's not going to happen because that money doesn't exist. And that money that's the gold is, a, as you said, it's a limited amount. So you can't just print more. That's the whole point of the store of value. It's a scarce asset. What I find so interesting, so I've been able to find statistics. Uh, so I just want to ask your opinion about this. I have found statistics that we have printed at least 40% Mm -hmm. of all the money in circulation in the last two years. Yes. Now, we didn't spend very much of that money on our people, right? We're talking about, you're right. I mean, nobody had any savings and, you know, people like the average savings in the U.S. is something like two weeks of money, mm -hmm. which is just terrible. And, and yet there is this kind of moment where it was like, oh, well, we're going to print all this money and then everybody will have and it didn't really, a lot of it didn't trickle down to the lower or the middle classes. So, which then reminds me of 2008 and the whole like big, too big to fail. But I had the same thought that you did when you were younger watching what happened to your parents. I had that same thought. Well, that's interesting. They're asking every citizen to repay their mortgages, holding them accountable for that. And yet bailing out these big corporations yeah. on this kind of, it, again, it's like, Elon Musk is going to buy Twitter for, you know, 42, 44 billion dollars if this happens. But if you divide the fact that there's 330 million people in the United States, you could give every human being in the United States a million dollars and still have lots of money left over. Which of these two things is a better use of our cash? And what would, you know, what kind, what would happen if every American had an influx of a million dollars? Okay, I think I just came up, came up with a brilliant movie idea. Okay, moving on. <laughs> I think that it's very important that we look at our past so that we can see what's going to start happening in our future. And more importantly, what's not going to happen in our future, which is Stuff's mm -hmm. not going to settle down and go back to, I'm using air quotes here if you're listening, instead of watching this, it's not going to go back to normal. Right. And I think it's really important that we ask the question. And so I'm asking you the question, if it's not going to go back to normal, 
What can we look forward to it looking like in 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important question. And I constantly think about, you know, what does the world look like, not only under the Bitcoin standard, but the transition to a Bitcoin standard, because I really think that Bitcoin is that that beacon of hope that we can rebuild something that is based on real value and more accessibility and inclusion. And, you know, something that I think about is that we I think a lot of people just they accept things the way they are because that's the way they've always been. Right. And the U S has just been known as the superpower and you yeah. go to work and like, we kind of get complacent in our lives. And I, and I hope to challenge that in people because at this point, unfortunately, the, the direction in which we're heading is our government cannot ever repay its debts. It's just, we say it in a, the Bitcoin space. It's just math. We have gone too far into debt. And so what we would need to do is we would need to essentially restructure our liabilities, which is a fancy way of saying, file for bankruptcy and say that we're unsolvent and try to try to fix that. And we can't do that. We can't do that as the global superpower and reserve currency. So what do we do? We keep printing money to service the debt that we can never pay off. And what does that happen when they print money? The money goes to the people at the top. They buy more assets, more bubbles are created, more savers get crushed, more and more wealth disparity, pressure down on society. We all get frustrated. We try to pick the politician that's going to be on our team and promise us whatever we want in order to survive. That's literally what's happening if we zoom out and now we have this beautiful piece of technology that's emerging that has no it decouples money and politics and power it decouples it for the first time in human history and it allows for the form of money that is democratic to potentially rise out of this it's almost like the flood is coming in and we bitcoiners are we've been building an ark and we we're saying come on like let's everybody get on the ark we're going to usher you know we got to the flood is coming no matter what the debt is coming due and no one can pay it. So like, let's usher in, let's go to a new world. Let's rebuild from scratch and let's make it more fair this time. Let's have it be a system where interest rates are based on actual prices. They're not manipulated and lowered or made, made to increase just because of a central group of people that nobody elected. Um, let's make it so that people are based on what they bring to the table. I provide this goods and good, good or service. I create this company and you judge it for the value that it actually has as, as opposed to these fluff valuations that easy money creates in these bubbles. You know, I think it's a way to build a system that could be really hopeful and, and could p provide more prosperity and wealth for everybody in the future. Is it going to be completely equal and egalitarian? No, because some people, you know what, they want to sit on the beach. They don't want to work. And some people want to work 70 hours a week, but there should be more choice and people shouldn't be working so hard for money. That's worth less and less and less, which is literally what happens toward the end of empires and the end of governments. It's like people eventually become serfs and the government centralizes and we have authoritarianism or totalitarianism. We don't want to go in that direction. Bitcoin is about hope. It's about rebuilding. It's about decentralizing. It's about creating value that's that's based on something real. And I, I see a lot of hope and I, I really would love to help people understand it because I know it can be intimidating, especially during crazy times. But I think it's the one thing that can usher in a future that is much more positive than the one that's being created with the fiat system. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I totally agree. I think that we're going to see a lot of changes. And I, I think, you know, there's always this gnashing of teeth when change happens. I mean, I have a background as a mindset coach and I am used to seeing people having a hard time with change. And I, what I'm looking at right now is a bunch of old white guys who do not want things to change. And those old white guys are still, for the most part, the ones that are in charge and the ones who have been in charge for a long time. So I think that anything that we can do to challenge that system and to say, you know, well, that's OK, but it's not logical or that's OK, but it's not accurate that's helpful because we're looking in the mirror and seeing the future and we're the ones who are going to have to carry that future forward into our reality. So it's vital that we're asking those questions that we're saying, you know, hey, you can't put 70 percent more water in the pool and say the pool's only rising, you know, 8 percent. It's just not that, you know, that's not going to work. So I think it's very important that we ask questions, that we challenge the mores mm -hmm. of the society that, you know, we've always been told were and therefore they will always be. I don't think that that's true anymore. And I loved what you said about 
you know, Bitcoin being decoupled from money and and government and politics and all it, it is because you said politics and and um, and government, I think, but also money, because money is part of that central system of governance and it's controlled by the central system of governments and Bitcoin can't be controlled by anybody. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you just one more question about that. So what I've been hearing from people as I've been studying these new worlds is that it, Bitcoin could still go to zero. Bitcoin could still be killed. And I don't believe that that's true because it is unique in its development and its true decentralization has given us the inability like Pandora's box is open and you can't close it again. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? And, and I know that a lot of people, I'm talking economic, uh, economists and politicians, they're the ones that are saying like, well, you can't trust this thing because it's gonna go back to zero. Yeah, I mean, when I hear that Bitcoin is going to zero from someone, then I know that they clearly have not researched uh, the Bitcoin technology network very much. Um, look, I don't, I don't believe that Bitcoin could go to zero in the same way that if we can place a value on the internet, you know, I, I wish we could have that comparison because the internet, you can't shut it down in every part of the world at the same time. And it adds so much value to the way in which we communicate and exchange information. And Bitcoin really does the same with value, with transacting or maintaining and storing value and energy. And so Bitcoin is in its entire existence in the 13 years that has been around, A, has never gone up and gone to zero. <laughs> OK, it's gone up and maybe been volatile, but it's always when you zoom out, gone up and up and up over the long term. And it's never been hacked. It's never been you know, shut down. There's no way that you can just shut down the Bitcoin network. And it's really proved its resiliency over the last 13 years. Early on, it probably could have been killed if the government really took it upon themselves to try to shut it down and there weren't en enough miners and it wasn't decentralized enough. But at this point, it's a situation where it's very akin to the Internet. You can't shut down and ban the Internet. You just can't. And I think it's really powerful. And I think the only thing I want people to be careful with is that when you set money aside, you have to know that it does carry short term risk and volatility. But in the long term, it could potentially be a massive ability to save for for whatever you want to purchase down the road. And um, and I just think that digging in a little bit to the technology is important. You don't have to fully understand the computer science in the same way that you and I probably can't, you know, figure out how to put it, put together a car engine. But we can appreciate a car and, and, you know, the value it brings our lives and the fact that we trust it to take us places. And in the same way, you know, I don't know how to program email or I don't know the early protocols that help helps build the internet, but you know, Bitcoin is essentially the same. It's an open software, open code protocol that everyone can see that no one can manipulate and control. And it's based on math. It's based on computer science, which to me is truth. It's a form of, of speech. Uh, so I think there's a lot of beauty in, in Bitcoin. And I hope that people don't look at it as something that could go to zero because at this point, I don't see, I don't see how that could happen. That would be the same as trying to shut down the internet or I don't know. I mean, that, that would mean like Armageddon to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, unless the power grid of the world goes down. And the whole case, world. The, the internet, Bitcoin. But then, as I always tell people when they ask me this, I'm like, yeah, but then we'll have bigger problems and it yeah. won't matter. And someday <laughs> someone will turn the power grid back on and then your Bitcoin yeah. will still be there. And, mm -hmm. you know, an, another thing that I think people fail to realize is that's true about all of our money unless yeah. it is being kept in a safe and unless it is, you know, gold bricks or whatever, or your physical cash, but then in the, if the whole world got shut down, your gold and your, and your cash would also lose their value because under those circumstances that you're going to want to trade stuff you can eat. You're going to yeah. want to trade stuff that has, you know, like, like legitimate utility right. in that circumstance. Yeah. So I agree with you. I, well, I've agreed with you from the moment you started speaking. I'm so <laughs> pleased. This is really cool because you've explained things in such a beautiful, easy to understand way for our thank audience. You. So thank you. So thank one you. more question, your last okay. question. Um, what's one more thing that you want all of the women listening or watching to know? Oh, gosh. Um, well, if you're if you're not in Bitcoin, I really just urge you to, you know, read the Bitcoin standard, ask, reach out, ask questions. If you're already in Bitcoin, then you know what? Just I know things are crazy right now, but try to enjoy 
your life, your relationships, your connections. Um, my, my grandmother, we lost my grandmother recently and it just reminds me how short Aww. life is, you know, yeah. and we're, we all want the same things at the end of the day. One of the reasons I'm so passionate is because like, we're all human. We need connection. We, we thrive when we are collaborative and when we, when we work together and so much in our nation has caused us to divide, right. And blame each other, but there's hope to, to come together. And we can do that in our own circles. We can do that with our families and with our loved ones. And like, there's so much beautiful life to be lived, no matter what the price of Bitcoin is. And like, I just, I just want to remind people of that because I think sometimes we get really bogged down with whatever we're doing and we have the stresses of life that impact us, but, you know, take a step back, take take a walk, take a deep breath, hug the person that you love because life is beautiful and it will get better. And, and I, I just want people to remember that. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Well, you said several times during this uh, talk, you said that uh, if you zoom out, you get that different perspective and everything you just said to me is about zooming out, yeah. you know, in the moment you can have a crisis or in the moment yeah. you can have something disastrous happened to you. But when you zoom out, life really is beautiful. I couldn't agree more. So Natalie, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your wisdom and your economic degree from the School of Hard Knocks with the audience. I really appreciate you being here. If you enjoyed this episode of Goddess of Crypto, please comment, please like, and share. I hope you will also check out Natalie's Coin Stories, which is an amazing show. And I will look forward to seeing you next time. Please share this with the women in your world, the mothers, the grandmothers, your daughters, your best friends. Let everyone know about the new energy of money. I'll see you next time. Every week, transformational wealth coach Hallie Evelyn leads a conversation that helps to ensure that women everywhere can learn to surf the coming tsunami of the new energy of money. You can find her at goddessofcrypto.me. That's goddessofcrypto.me. Be sure to subscribe to Goddess of Crypto on your favorite platform or watch the show on YouTube. And remember, wealth isn't just your privilege, it's your right. <laughs>